Do not follow in the way of those who are thick-headed, stubborn, hard-headed, foolish, saith the Lord to the prophet Ezekiel, because they are a rebellious house. He promises to make the prophet just as hard and as strong as those who doubt and reject the word of God, because they are a rebellious house, rebelling against authority, by which he says ultimately they are rebelling against him. They rebel against authority because they don't know God, not anymore. They don't have faith, trust, and love in God above all things. They do not hold God as the sole author and perfecter of everything. They rebel against the authority of the world because ultimately they rebel against God and against his Christ. And so Matthew was a tax collector, hated and despised by all the major factions of the Jews, by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, by the Zealots, even the Herodians. Everybody hated tax collectors. Well, the Roman Empire had the most efficient and corrupt tax system ever in human history. The entire empire depended on a bureaucracy of two, two people. In the Roman Senate, there were two financial officers called quaestors. These two quaestors were the entire internal revenue service for the vast Roman Empire. You talk about the small government, small bureaucracy of your dreams. Two people were the IRS. The downside to that is the way they collected money. And that was subcontracting. These two men would take every territory of the empire, written on a piece of paper, to the steps of the Senate House, and they would hold an auction. And you would buy the contract to raise taxes for a particular area. You then paid them the money, and the Roman government, cash in hand, collected all of their annual taxes just like that at a single auction and had all this money to truck into their treasury to run their empire. And then you went to your territory and collected those taxes. Of course, you understand, the way you made a profit at this was by collecting more than you were supposed to, by taxing people at two or three times the actual legal rate because then you pocketed the difference. One reason everybody hated tax collectors then is because they were thieves. They would lean on you for more money than you actually owed. The second problem with taxation, particularly for the Jewish people of the first century, was that all the major Jewish factions regarded it as collaborating with an evil occupying power. You were working with the Romans. You were in bed with the Romans. You were part of a pagan system that was oppressing their people who had stolen their land and stolen their country and stolen their future and you were collaborating with them. So this is Matthew, the tax collector. Even if he's an honest tax collector and he only collects a moderate amount of profit to make his living, he's in bed with the Roman authorities, right? Right? Are they not right in judging him so harshly? Would we not do the same? Ah, but here's the problem, friends. They are a rebellious house. All of them. Rebelling against whatever authority God has put over them because ultimately, he said, they rebel against him. It has become the stuff of legend and the stuff of every movie we were probably raised on and unfortunately, we may have heard it in Sunday school. But the truth is, the Romans never conquered the Holy Land. The Romans were not an evil occupying power. The Romans sort of took over the Holy Land slowly over time because of the negligence of their own government. For those of you that were in our Bible study where we covered the Apocrypha, we got all this history with the book of Maccabees. When the Israelites fought for their independence from the Greeks, the only friend they had was Rome. Roman legions came to the land to liberate it, to crush the old Greek empire, and to give the Israelites their sovereignty back. 
They even signed a treaty where they kept some bases in the area to make sure they kept the Greeks out. And slowly and surely, because of ineptitude, the weakness of the next ruling dynasty of Canes, the Hasmoneans, who spent more time, well, fornicating and drugging and drinking than actually running their government, the Romans ended up taking over more and more function of the government. See, this is the problem. The problem with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Zealots and the way they judged people like Matthew goes to the core of how they were judging their own government. They literally got the government they deserved, and they had it coming. They got the government that God gave them because of the weakness and ineptitude of the people that should have been keeping his covenant and living according to his law. They got what they got because they deserved it and they had it coming. Any sort of strange patriotic notion that they held, that once upon a time, we had a perfect country under the Hasmoneans. No, you didn't. We had a strong and independent country before the Roman. No, you didn't. We had a proud and moral country before the pagan. No, no, you didn't. Actually, you had none of those things. The things they imagined that their nation had once been were completely figments of their imagination. And by such, they judged the world as it was then by the fiction of their golden age that never existed. And they rejected God. They never once looked at the situation they were in and said, we deserve this. Let's make the best of this. How do we fix this now? The only thing they could arrive at was more corruption, more evil, and more bloodshed. To eventually, their dream of the zealots was to rise up in bloody rebellion and kill all those Roman pagans who had actually not done anything wrong. We will kill them because they stole our land, which they never actually did. We will destroy them because they've taken over our country, which actually you gave it to them. All of this confusing mess and because they didn't accept the judgment of what they got because of what they had done, they hated people like Matthew, who by all accounts was just making an honest living. He was judged negatively for having a good job. He was judged negatively for going to work, for paying his taxes, for obeying the law, for accepting things as things were, and actually doing things like being a husband and a father and a citizen and a family man instead of longing for the day that he could run amok and destroy everything because of a fantasized perceived injustice that happened somewhere in a past that never actually existed. This is a pattern of human beings for millennia in every time and place where there is dissent and dissension and rebellion to glorify the past and or glorify the fantastical future and therefore not to be in the present doing the works of God. Nobody would invite Matthew over for dinner except other people just as ostracized as him. The hard-headed people of the Israelites, the people that God warned Ezekiel they were a rebellious house, continued to be that for centuries after Ezekiel and always because that's what we sinful human beings are. Hard-headed, thick skulled short-sighted, and rebellious against the word of God. Matthew's behavior is the thing that makes the most sense, though it is the most out of the blue for us. A random rabbi named Jesus walks by and says, follow me. And he leaves everything to follow Jesus. Now let's be clear. It doesn't say he never went back to his booth or that he quit his job and didn't continue to do it. Even John the Baptist had told everybody, if you're a tax collector, collect what's honest. If you're a soldier, don't extort people. If you're in the garrison, don't, don't use your authority unjustly on people. In other words, you can be a godly person in any God-given vocation if you're a godly person in that vocation. But Matthew gets up and he's done for the day and he immediately follows Jesus 
not out of the blue. He's certainly heard of Jesus. He knows that he's a rabbi. He has heard about the things he is teaching. But Jesus says, follow me. In this brief exchange, what Jesus says to Matthew is, I'm not ashamed of you. I am not judging what you have to do for a living. I won't put you out of the synagogue or the temple. In a world full of Levite priests, of Pharisaic rabbis, of religiosity type people, religious vocation individuals, priests and rabbis, whose job it was, was to help him be set free of his sin, they will not have any discourse with one like Matthew who is beneath them. But Jesus says, be with me. He's willing to have Matthew. He calls him to be an apostle. What else can Matthew do but immediately join Jesus? The one who comes to preach the word of God in truth, who's willing to take him. And what else can Matthew do but he holds a party? Did you notice that in the text? He immediately holds a party and has Jesus to his house. And Matthew invites everybody that he knows and that will come to his house. Other tax collectors, other generic sinners, probably gamblers and loan sharks and prostitutes, the degenerates of his era, the only people that that polite culture would allow him to associate with, he calls them all to dinner with Jesus reclining at the table. Because Matthew is the one who responds rightly, not by his, his own judgment about the way things were or ought to be or should be in the future, not by his judgment against people doing what they had to, to survive. Matthew is called by Jesus just because he's one in need of redemption. And Matthew knows that the only thing you can do when you hear that good news is to hold a party, to call together everybody else that's never heard that either. Everyone that he knew that was also unwelcome anywhere else with the good news that the Christ has come and he calls all of us to table and we're all welcome. We're all welcome to be in his presence for he comes to heal those that know that they are sick and not the self-righteous who think they have no flaws and need no redemption. Matthew does first what Jesus will do at the institution of this sacrament. Hold a party. Call together the faithful and say, this is the feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. The Son of God has come to the wedding feast, and behold, all sinners are called. Everyone has a past, and everyone has a future, and everyone has a present, and everyone is valuable. And everyone is valued and loved as they are for what they are, as what they are called to be out of darkness and into light, to recline at this table where the self-righteous are not welcome, but everyone who needs the medicine of eternal life can receive it and have it. What else can we do to that invitation but rise from our tax-collecting booth, rise from our booth of worldly things, and follow him. In Jesus' name, amen.